Hello, welcome to the Winners Night Away show, your weekly go-to podcast for the 1% discussing winning strategies, how they built their winning teams and got winning results. If you're ready to grow and execute, communicate better than ever have it, bring on that simplification and prioritization that they have to make your dreams come true, then get your headphones on and keep your notebook close. Let's go on a journey together. Hello, welcome to the Winners Find Away Show. I am your host, Trent Clark, CEO of Leadershipity, serial entrepreneur. I am also the CEO of AIM for NIL. And everyone knows me mostly for global speaking and being a coach in professional baseball coaching in three World Series. And I am with my good friend, Brett Portera. Brett, what's up, man? Hey, Trent, how are you? Man, it's not every day I get to interview the guy who owns a surf club. All right, like that's what's pretty cool. Is like, man, you, you're you kind of reinventing this thing. And I'm super excited about some of the things you've done out there. And of all places, New York. Like, you're not starting a surf club in San Diego. You're not starting it. Like, you're doing the New York thing. So, Brett, great to have you on the show. And welcome, buddy. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on. I'm excited to uh, tell my story a little bit and have a nice conversation. Yeah, for sure. I love your backdrop for Crest. The new surf club out in Long Island, which is all, all under construction and ready to load. Now, when I think of like some of the indoor surf clubs, I immediately think of like, you know, the wave pool and like, you know, wave on a on a cruise ship that's got like one wave and it's like, oh, hey, it's an eight footer and learn how to wakeboard or, you know, something on there. Tell me a little bit different about how the surf club certainly separates yourself as well as being in Long Island, which is not probably a 12 month surf season. Yeah. So what we're doing here is a, a bit different from what's on the market right now. If you look out there, there's about a dozen facilities around the world that are up and running as uh, wave pools, surf parks, you know, surf, uh, surf pools, whatever, whatever you want to call them. So it is a bit of a newer industry. For us, we took a more of a we put a focus on the experience rather than on the quantity of people that are, you know, are going to be going to the facility on a daily basis. So our pool wasn't designed for 100 people an hour to be in there, uh, like your traditional wave pool or or like the flow riders like you see on the back of the cruise ships that like have a, a lower number of people that can go on, but it's more of a high throughput. Uh, for us, we really focused on the wave that we were going to be able to make and then kind of the experience that's around that. So it is a, a club, you know, similar to a golf club or a yacht club or a social club or something of that matter. So we'll have a community of members and they'll be able to surf this pool year round it is outdoor, but it is heated. So it's a uh, quite, quite different experience than going in the ocean in, in New York. I know we were talking before right now, the water temperature is about 46 degrees on a day like today in our pool, it would be north of 70. So definitely more enjoyable, but we, our, our focus really is to deliver a world-class surfing experience, you know, close to home. So people don't have to travel if they don't want to, and you know, can access it year round. Super fun and exciting, man. Now, a little background on you, 28, you're a young dude son of an entrepreneur, so entrepreneurial family, played a little lacrosse in college, which I love, a little lax, and spent some time down both at Bentley in Massachusetts and then also Rollins down in uh, Winter Park, Florida, a great, great little school down in Florida, a little shout out to the Rollins folks. And man, lax, you're a tough guy. Like lax, no joke, man. Like you gotta be, it's not for the faint at heart. This is like tennis meets football meets, you know, all sorts of stuff going on with some hand-eye coordination. That's unreal. Yet at any morning, at any moment, someone will bust you in the mouth. <laughs> it's always an interesting game to watch. I've had some of my boys play it and fun to watch. Great, great spectator sport. Yeah, it, it is. It's always been fast paced. You know, as, as you get older and the level of play gets better, it just gets more and more entertaining to watch. And like many sports, college lacrosse is kind of the, the epitome of you know, that's what everybody wants to watch the most entertaining by far. And yeah, I, I, at first, to be honest, when I was probably like in second grade, and I first put the helmet on, it was so uncomfortable. I did, didn't want to do it. Came back to it a couple of years later and fell in love with it and, and still play it to this day. So, yeah. Now, are you also, I mean, being a Long Islander, being a, you know, Northeast guy, are you also a hockey player, Brett? So growing up, I always wanted to be. But I never, I played roller hockey a little bit, but I never played ice, never like made the investment to do it. Recently, I have made that investment to try and play. So now I'm trying to play as, as an older gentleman, never playing before. So I'm doing all right. But uh, yeah. Great workout now as an adult, right? Like it's, it's a fast paced game and you are gonna, you know, it's amazing when you're on a cold sheet of ice. 
how much you can sweat working out an hour, I know. right? It's, yeah, and it's so, crazy. And I ask that because a lot of hockey guys transition to lacrosse, right? It's a very common thing that lacks in hockey. You know, lax is kind of like the the off season sport if you're a hockey player or vice versa. And so I see that a lot as far as my boys who they had a lot of lax players on their teams. Yeah, I wish I played more hockey growing up. My kids will, if I'm lucky enough to have boys and or girls, will I'll definitely push them in the direction of playing ice hockey. So. Well, hey man, maybe soon you're an engaged guy. Congratulations on that. So a lot going on there. Now let's get back to your dad. Dad's an entrepreneur, has long standing long business in Long Island has a pretty sizable supply house and now he's involved, right? He's involved in the family business. He's mentoring and definitely probably investing as well as as much as he'd like and or much as he dislike. I don't know. He's in. So, and then your uncle's an investor as well. You got some cousins involved. So this is a real family operation and this is not restricted to Long Island. I mean, you're, you're looking at this being the HQ and the launching pad of a number of locations. And I know you've identified already 12 sizable markets for for your fit here. So walk us through a little bit of your client because, you know, I I think we talked a little bit about this offline. When I think about a Crest Surf Club, man, I'm thinking, man, I thought everyone in surfing was like Spicoli. You know, you're walking around a beach, man, like rarely got clothes on, you know, the little oxide on the nose and not exactly what I'm thinking of affluent that can afford a membership at the club and almost uh, anti-membership establishment, right? As part of the surfer lore goes is, you know, no one owns the waves, no one owns the beach. But talk to me a little bit about, because I, w- I was surprised a little bit when I started reading up on the demographics of actually who's out there surfing. Yeah. So I, we talked about this a little bit offline too, like Surfers are a passionate bunch. So whether you are a high school kid that has no income or you're 67 years old and you're retired and anybody in between, you know, there's people who surf. And I know we were saying like, oh, you know, you're seeing more of a trend of 500 CEOs and all these, you know, top level executives that you think are more drawn to golf than surfing that are now surfing. I think part of that has to do with, you know, surfing is very low impact. So you can do it, you know, later on in age too. So I know connecting to hockey again, our neighbor is a big hockey player and he was talking to us about surfing, never surfed a day in his life, was interested in buying a membership. And he's probably about 50 years old because he was looking at it as something that he can transition to later in life and stay active. So for us here in New York, we know that we have a really strong market. It ranges from, you know, kind of your average upper end blue collar family, you know, that might work in construction or, you know, is, you know, blue collar manual labor uh, has been successful all the way through, you know, multi-millionaires, billionaires that have, are either currently running companies or have sold companies or even generational wealth. So we do have a really uh, broad demographic that we've been attracting. Some of these people have never surfed before. Some of them are seasoned surfers. So the great part about having a wave pool is that you can control the environment. So unlike the ocean, which really is like the great equalizer, because you can't control what waves you get and you, know, yeah. you can't control who you're in the water with. In a wave pool, you can, you know, with the touch of a button can change the conditions so you can kind of cater to everybody. And then there's also a lot of people out there that are, you know, older than I that have children now and they want to get their kids into surfing and, you know, it's a safer way to do it. So. It's been a really broad demographic that we've pulled. You know, out of, we've sold almost fifty percent of our memberships now in the last year and a half or so. And we have people that are Long Island natives, New York City natives, and then we have a, a good chunk that are even out of state, whether it be Connecticut, New Jersey, Florida. We have somebody a member from Hawaii. We have a handful of members from California. So going back to your your point of we've already looked at uh, markets to scale this. Yeah, this is our our launch pad, hopefully for multiple Crest Surf Clubs that we've already started to develop those markets as well. Yeah, and I, I, one of the staggering statistic about you know your twelve demographics is that you've identified potential prospects for the club. And I, and one of the things I love about surfing is, and it's a lot like skateboarding. There's parity, right? When people are out on the water and they know the etiquette, like, hey, everybody's equal, right? Like nobody, like they don't care if you're a Fortune CEO or you're a thirteen year old you know, out of your freshman class, skipping half day of school because you want to catch waves. Everybody's together in this. And there's a camaraderie that I think is really good. I think as an athlete, it's one of the things I loved. And you probably didn't see it in lax. And I didn't see a lot in baseball either. But when someone really makes a personal best, uh, does something that they were unable to do, you know, and I saw this so much in, in skateboarding, you know, everybody's tapping the board, man. They're hitting the water when somebody does something really good. And they're excited for their counterparts, not 
envy. It's not jealousy. Like, oh, well, I wish I could do that. You know, I wish I could walk the front board. You know, like people aren't like jealous. Listen, maybe they want to, but the reaction is it's it's more of a wow. I'm excited for you. I know how hard that is, and I really appreciate you know the time and effort it takes to learn that. And and I love that about those two sports where, you know, quite frankly, you know, sportsmanship is losing a little bit, in my opinion, on some of the big sports. And by the way, we love to highlight this crap with fights on TV and stupid parents acting dumb and all sorts of different things that happen. And then you catch a sport in this environment and like, hey, man, if I'm going to go spend my time, you know, this is where I want to go get fit. I want to be active and I want to be around people that are looking to help people get better and improve and encourage them. Not, you know, beer league hockey where let's let's throw cage cage punches, which is like, I don't know who's hurting. <laughs> like when right. Everyone's got a cage on. I don't really know if it's hurting anybody. And everyone's got to go to work the next day and, and people acting like morons, you know. So it's a factor that I love about it. And, and tell me what you're seeing in the club. Yeah. So I think that camaraderie piece is really important to us. So like that's really what Crest is. It's, it's a community at the end of the day. And it's a community centered around surfing lifestyle. So, you know. As surfers, you want to be a better surfer and you want to surf more. It's just the two kind of pillars. That's just what it is. And if you tell me otherwise, you probably don't surf enough or you, know, or you just had a bad experience. But anybody who really loves it, like that's what kind of drives them at the end of the day. So that's what yeah. we've tried to do with Crest is, is create a place where it is community centered, where you can bring your friends, you can bring your family, you can make friends because there is a, a large part of the surfing community that probably doesn't have you know, friends and family that do surf. It's like, for example, we're a family of five. I'm the oldest of three boys. My mom doesn't surf. My two other brothers, they surf a little bit, but not really. One of them more so than the other. It's really my dad and I who surf. And, you know, my dad's going to be 64 in a couple of weeks. And, you know, a lot of his friends don't surf anymore. So it's, it's one of those things where if you can create a place where there is that community around there and everybody is stoked for you. And, you know, is excited about what you're doing and sharing that passion. It makes that much, that much more enjoyable too. Yeah, man, 64, he, he didn't run into having you too early. Like he, he, he waited a minute, you know, like to get his kids going, you know, like that's pretty cool. You're seeing a lot in families like that. And now a successful entrepreneur himself willing to give back and come alongside one of his sons and create a great community for surfing, but also a great family dynamic. And I think that's really cool too, as is so common in some of the movies we've seen. Love the movie that Disney put out about the young lady who lost her arm. And you can see the family dynamic is part of the surfing culture, right? They're all in it. They all go on, you know, Saturday mornings together. It's it's clear this isn't like, hey, sometimes we one person's off and running. This is something that they all like. Obviously, live in Hawaii where there's a whole another surfing culture there. But super cool. And I think one of the superpowers you talked about when we talk about the 16 strategies of growth is You've got this culture. You think you've dialed this thing in on the family culture, the dynamic of the culture of surfing and bringing the people in for the right reason and, and all getting together and have a place they can be together and learn together and grow together and certainly enjoy uh, some different dynamics of surfing that otherwise they probably wouldn't get because of your ability to control that environment. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. It's all about creating that sense of community and making everybody feel safe and welcome and, you know, and, and also progression, you know, as a, a multi-sport athlete and growing up and playing competitively, and still playing competitively, like you always want to be better and just giving people the tools and access to those tools, because it's not necessarily always the case. The ocean isn't, like I said, it's a great equalizer. It's not always welcoming for beginners, or it doesn't always give you, you know, you never get the same wave twice. So not being able to practice that way and being able to unlock all this in a pool, it, it really changes things. Yeah. I like the dynamic of the feedback. You know, you talk about us athletes, right? We, we grew up in feedback. We grew up in coaching. We grew up in having someone right there to assist along the way and better drill and just getting better each day. And man, you know, obviously when you're out on the surf, and I've only been out on the West Coast. You know, the beach is pretty long and big, right? <laughs> like, so you don't really know anybody. You're not having a ton of discussions on this. There's every once in a while, someone comes alongside you and gives you a couple of tips. But man, to be in a surf club where a bunch of people are just all in and fully committed, what a great environment and dynamic to, to get better and learn and, and capture some of that great feedback. Yeah, definitely. And you know, just going 
piggybacking off other sports, right? You know, video review and film has just been so big, you know, whether it's for lacrosse, baseball, football, whatever sport it is. And uh, sports like surfing and skateboarding and snowboarding is a, a bit further ahead, I would say. But uh, surfing is really far behind in, in that aspect. So being able to bring that in is, is game changing, whether, you know, you're you know, 40, 50 years old and you're just trying to catch more waves and stay in shape or you're a young kid that you know has hopes of being on the world tour and being an Olympic athlete one day. You know, that really changes things and being able to give the same wave over and over again, like just that progression level goes through the roof and that, you know, if you're better at something, you're going to enjoy it more, right? Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of that because, you know, technology is a, di a dynamic there, right? Because, you know, trying to record something from the beach, it's limited. You can't get a camera wet, so you're not risking going in the water. You know, only the high end folks had that, you know, back in the day. It's becoming more accessible, but still not quite there. And so, wow, like I hadn't even considered the fact of that feedback of the dynamics of video, which I agree with you as athletes. You know, what we always had a saying, like the video doesn't lie, right? <laughs> like, oh, no, yeah. Brett, I was I was in the perfect position. I was right where I was supposed to be. Oh, Brett, let's go back to the film. <laughs> like, oh, oh, maybe I was a little bit off there, right? And so it's the great equalizer, right? Yeah. And we have a, uh, a team of pros, former pros and professional surfers coaches that are really excited about it from that perspective too. You know, one of their goals is to take a kid that's probably just going to start out surfing and develop him over the years and then hopefully get him to a point where he's competing on the world tour and you know, who knows, even an Olympic athlete. And I think you're going to see more and more of that as this industry continues to grow and develop and we're not the only ones doing it. Everybody's trying to incorporate that coaching and progression aspect into their the facilities, but it'll be really neat, you know, to have surfers that, you know, didn't grow up surfing in the ocean, you know, might get somebody who's landlocked. You said you're from Michigan, right? Maybe you'll have a, you know, somebody who's competing from Michigan one day. Kind of. Hey, we're not of, landlocked, bro. We're from surrounded by uh, yeah. lakes. And yeah. Like, but I don't know if they're great surfing lakes. Yeah, right? not there, the is some, there is some wave, but like, you know, eight, 10 footers is pretty big out on, you know, Lake Michigan or something like that. But, you know, I think it's a really cool concept, Brett, that you, know, you got someone out on the tour from Nebraska, right? I mean, you're like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, here's this corn husker man and you're like wow this kid's special he learned and can come out and navigate the environment so yeah and you don't see that today right it, there is a limit to the tour of it's primarily if you're coastal you have a shot at the tour if you're not you don't you know yep. you're not seeing colorado kids montana wyoming they're not coming right and so it's a whole nother dynamic that's a really fun aspect let's stay with some of the coaching that you talked about because one of the other 16 strategies of growth that you have that you've separated yourself from competition is you really got the right people and leadership. Talk to us a little bit about that, not just starting with you and your dad. And I definitely want to hear that, but some of the other key people that are coming along and are involved. Sure. So like you mentioned before, it's kind of a family, bus family driven business. So my dad and I, my dad started his own business out of the back of his car, probably when he was around my age. And now he does going for 15 million in sales this year. So he's been successful over the years. He grew that himself, you know, didn't really have any outside investors and kind of was able to do that with putting the right people around him, making the right relationships. So that was something that I saw very early on. I took a lot of that consideration as I you know, grew up and worked in his business and saw how it operated and, you know, took what I learned in sports about you know, really being a cohesive team and tried to apply that to what we're doing here at Crest. So it really started with our our team of contractors that are going to be building this. So kind of sticking on that family business thing, we really like to do business with people that we know or that, you know, is a mutual connection of someone else. So our team is all either worked together before or, you know, worked with other members or other friends of team members. And we've had them together for the last seven years, way before that we even started to uh, build this thing really throughout the design process. So I think that's been a really key strength. We didn't go and hire a GC, you know, after everything was approved and go, hey, build this. It was, we got everybody's input starting from day one of like, this is what we want to build. We want to hear from all of you. Like, what do you think will work? What won't work based on your, your relevant experience? And although this industry is really new and there's only a handful of people out there that have built surf parks before, you know, we tried to find connections to groups and contractors that have done, you know, things that are applicable, for example, our concrete contractor, he does foundations for skyscrapers in New York City. So like when we bring him, you know, you know, a rectangular pool that he has to build out of concrete, his response was this is easy. So that was kind of like the the relationships we tried to we tried to leverage. Everybody on our team 
you know, it's like I said, been involved in giant projects before, much larger than this, you know, for the past 30, 40 years. So we're really confident in getting it built. And then kind of taking a more of a narrow scope into like Crest itself. My dad and I obviously being the founders, my uncle came in as one of the investors and then his son, my cousin, just so happens to be a really good salesperson. He worked for a company called Legends, which you may or may not be familiar. I know they do a lot of stuff for MLB teams and they do a lot of sales, but he opened up SoFi Stadium for the Rams and was, I believe, their top salesperson there. And wow. the membership structure for an NFL seat is very, very similar to our membership structure here at Crest for, you know, a surfing membership. So it was, you know, very easy for him to, to take what he had done in the past and apply it to here. Although he wasn't a surfer, he's a snowboarder. So there was a little bit of a learning curve there. You know, he's been awesome and he, he's very, probably doesn't get enough credit. I need to give a little bit more. And that's one of the things we talked about before, being able to, to celebrate our wins a little bit better. But, you know, a lot of where we're at today is because, you know, aside from that, we do have our own technology partner that we're piloting for Crest and the lead engineer there built Kelly Slater Surf Ranch, which is the best wave pool in the world at this point in time. So, you know, we're really confident there, his experience, both in design and development of the technology from the ground up, and then just, you know, the overseeing of making sure it gets built correctly and then operated. And then we started to identify partners from an operational standpoint that have relevant industry experience or parallel industry experience, whether it be a golf course or a yacht club or something of that nature, or even a ski resort that can help us come in and deliver on the experience that we want to, you know, we're telling people and we're selling people on at the end of the day. So I think uh, it all kind of boils down to knowing your strengths and strengths and weaknesses and being able to say, hey, like I need help with this. And uh, I personally feel like that's, you know, one of my leadership qualities is being able to put the right people around me and kind of rely on, you know, not necessarily decision by committee type of approach, but just having a strong team that's there to help guide. And, you know, everybody has their strengths that we can really play into. It's awesome. Yeah. A little identification real quick. I am the author of a book called Leading Winning Teams. And when you talk about Brett Portiera and Crest Surf Club and a person coming out of athletics, his father's entrepreneurial background, you know, they are talking about a cohesive leadership team and written this book based on all those skill sets that we learn in athletics. Now, and appropriate that in leadership in an organization and some of the key elements. So encourage you to go out, pick it up. It's on sale right now, pre-sale on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. You can see it online and I'll have those in the links below as well as a chapter for you. If you'd like to download a chapter on winning teams and getting your right team in place, as Brett has done so well doing, uh, you definitely want to check that out. And that link is below free gift to you. Check it out on building your cohesive winning team. So on the other side, Brett, that I want to talk about with you is that side of celebration, right? This is a challenge area for a lot of organizations. You know, we, we get all of our things done and, and we're used to it in sports. Usually the celebration comes because of our success, right? And we're almost conditioned like, oh, we're not allowed to celebrate unless we win something. <laughs> like, hey man, we've gotten a lot better and, and I can celebrate the fact that you know, hey, we won 33% of our games. And this year we won 60% of our games, which is a massive turnaround. And you're like, wow, a playoff team in that quick. And we hear on the pro level, right, that it's very infrequent that a team goes from, from worst to first, right? It's a building process. Like, hey, we reached our goals. We finished second to last. We finished in the middle of the tier the next year. And that second tier, you know, in, in, the, in the year after that made the playoffs. The year after that, now we're competing for a, for a championship. And so, unfortunately, it, it doesn't typically happen overnight. But that idea of celebrating along the journey, that's challenging for us athletes. That's not an easy thing because we're used to putting our head down. And do you think we're measuring the wrong result? Or what do you think the reason is we do that? Yeah, so I, I think you summed it up really good. And that's definitely something that I, I struggle with. And I don't know if it's measuring the wrong result or just not just being so fixated on getting a result that you kind of, you know, you don't enjoy the ride. Like my dad's really big on that and kind of pushes me like, Hey, like you gotta enjoy the ride. Like don't not, it's not necessarily about where you're going. It's how you get there. Right. It is tough. Like being conditioned to like wanting to win, wanting to be the best, like growing up that way as, as an athlete, like it, it's tough to say, take a step back and say, Oh, well, you know, we're the only ones in New York that have gotten this project approved and you know, many have tried and failed. And, you know, we are, you know, it took us five years to get our permits. We finally got those, like, you know, being able to, to recognize those wins and, and celebrate them. It just, I think for me personally, it's more so that there's so much more that still needs to be done that it is, I don't want to say distracting, but in some, in a sense, distracting, like to, to stop and, and recognize that stuff. I think that's yeah. 
I personally struggle with. Yeah. And so I think the dynamic that hurts growing teams is that we're constantly driven for, you know, more, be better, accomplish another thing. And when we do accomplish something significant, like getting a permit that no one ever had, you know, taking that moment to say like, hey, listen, we are on our way. Let's celebrate this step in the journey, right? And I think you know, we did that poorly in, in pro sports too. When we finished, I think, one year second to last, and then the next year we went to the league, you know, the American League pennant and lost in a tight pennant race and didn't get to go to the World Series. It's like, oh, well, an abrupt end, disappointing for sure, Yet major steps have come in. You know, you went from the 28th ranked team in, in Major League Baseball to the top four, right? Like, this is a pretty big turnaround, right? Like, this is pretty good. And we're all like, oh, we failed. Because what are we measuring? We're measuring if you, if you don't win a world title, you know, right. it's, it, we're back all Ricky Bobby. Like, oh, I'm first loser, right? <laughs> like, you know, like, I don't think that's the way to look at stuff. And especially the fact of, you know, the accomplishments along the way. And there are many, right? And, and, and as teams, we look at that and you probably went through this at Rollins. Like, oh, this year was, we've never scored more goals at Rollins than this year. Or there was never, we haven't won this conference championships back to back since X. There's always little measurements that say, hey, maybe we didn't win a national title. Maybe we didn't, you know compete as high as we wanted, but there is definitely accomplishment and going in the right direction. And I think it's really important for team members on the journey to feel that because I think it's little drops of motivation along the way that everybody needs another recharge. Like, Hey man, like we weren't as good a year ago as we are now. And let's rear view mirror this thing for a second. And I tell a lot of people, you know, rip that rear view mirror off because, you know, we, we want to look in the rear view mirror and, and, and check it out and, scan it and then move forward. That's why the big windshield, small rear view mirror, small backup camera, can, you know, video, the windshield's eight to, you know what, 20 times that thing, right? So at the end of the day, we are moving forward, but it, sometimes it's really important to take a glance and recognize like, wow, we've, we've come pretty far. Yeah, I, and I think, like I said, that's something that I need to, to focus a bit more on and, and do a little better and, and celebrate the small small victories, right? It's really important in business, especially as a startup, because you know, there are probably more losses than there are wins nine out of 10 times. So being able to stop and take a second and recognize that, okay, that was a small victory, you know, no matter how small it is, whether it's getting somebody to answer the call for a sales meeting that has been ducking you for you know, the previous nine outreaches or whatever it is, or getting your permits after five years, I think that is all all really important. I think that's you know, somewhere that I want to improve on and, you know, and inspire my team to be, you know, better at, at you know, all together because it all starts at the top too at the end of the day. Yeah. Oh, that's good, man. And I, I think, I think you just hit it there, Brett. Like when you are into celebration, right, they're going to go as you go, likely. I mean, and so that top becomes evident, you know, how we do that diligently with organizations we work, we use the Bloom Crew software, which I love. And the weekly meeting has a number of to-dos. And everyone in the organization has their to-dos for the week. And, you know, it's it's not easy to get everything done. As you know, there's plenty of hurdles and there's plenty of roadblocks in your way. And you're like going, man, I thought we'd have this permit by now. And now the city or whatever, the county, you're held up. And you're like, man, this is on my to-do list. I got to go to my weekly meeting and for the third week in the row, tell my team, hey, this isn't done yet. And and that may be affecting their to-dos and their ability to get some of their roles done. So when we do hit that, man, like it's a, it's a big deal when somebody comes in, they've done their four out of four every week. And like you celebrate even on the weekly that someone's moving it. Cause you know, you and I know both from, from the sports world, the little victories add up, man. I mean, and when you understand how victory works, victory works on the daily victory doesn't work like on the quarters or on the annual because there's a lot of daily work that's got to go in to assure the big victories is that fair yeah yeah no it definitely is and i think bill belichick says it really well right do your job and it, if everybody does their job and you know, is able to get their small victories it does add up to you know a big win for, for everybody yeah i love i love the bill belichick quote i'll know we have a great team when everybody on the team knows their role and they're doing it. And man, I, I was I was so like, I, I put that in the book, actually, because I love that line. And it's just probably, Brett, I'm going to guess that about 80% of the organizations I go into, that's not happening at some level, right? And even if it's 25%, if it's 25% of the people don't know their role, don't know their responsibilities, 
which is staggering, right? Or it's 25% actually do know it. They're just not doing it. <laughs> right? yeah. And and no one's holding them accountable to be like, hey, I don't know if you know or not, Trent, but you're failing and not meeting the responsibilities and our expectations. And I see organizations that don't even tell these people. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, six months later, like, oh, hey, Trent, by the way, we're going to let you go. Oh, well, for what? Well, you really haven't met the responsibilities and our expectations. I know we didn't tell you what they were, but like you haven't met them. <laughs> like, oh, oh, you know, like, wow, a, a real downside of communication that gets missed. And man, and you and I probably coach for people like that, right? Where they just weren't, didn't, didn't provide the clarity of the direction. You can see there's a concept, but everyone's kind of guessing what it might be. Yeah. And I think it's communication thing. I think it also can like from a business perspective too, it can be more often than not, you know, better than I would, but from what I've seen a function of being too big too, which I think is what I, I like about us too, is that you know, we are, although it might be more work for me and my team, the fact that it is really a small kind of tight knit group, everybody knows their roles, their responsibilities, and also to the point that people are willing to go outside of their role and responsibility because they're invested in what's going on and they want to see it succeed. And I think when you get to a point where there's too many hands in the cookie jar or you know, there's a lack of communication, you start to lose things like that and you lose that motivation, which I think it all comes back to you know, celebrating small victories and having achievable milestones and things of that nature. Yeah, I think that's dead on. If there was, what do you think is the one thing? I mean, you studied business, you studied entrepreneurship in college. You had a you had a role model. What would be the biggest thing you learned as a young man, as a young athlete and business school uh, student that now you really recognize as an entrepreneur? Like, well, this has never been more true. I, I probably have a negative and a positive. Negative one that there are a lot of tire kickers out there. So yeah. there's people that will blow, you know, just blow smoke up up your ass a little bit, and we'll try to say, yeah, you know, you're really good at this, or like, yeah, we'll just that almost unachievable goals and kind of string you along and whether it is a coach, you know, telling you like, you need to do this, that, and the other thing, and they're never going to play you. Even if you do do that, so I've definitely you know, gone through that before. And it's unfortunate from a sports side of things to, you know, trying to raise money and dealing with investors that just kind of string you along that, you know, kind of comes down to, they say, you know, they'll string you along for months at a time through due diligence and they'll come back and say, yeah, I'm not interested for X, Y, Z reasons. And Nine out of 10 times, it's XYZ reasons you address, you know, early on and you thought you got past them, right? So I think that's like one of the negative things. You see that a lot and, and you don't really learn that until you're in it. You know, I, my dad had a better handle on stuff like that because he'd been in business for 35 years now. So he, you know, he knows, you know, people that are going to act like they're going to buy that never do and kind of string it along. And that's something that I learned from positive. I think that you have a lot of cheerleaders out there, yeah, almost the exact opposite, right? So whether it's people that are customers or are directly involved in the project or just watching from far, you have a bigger support ne network than you really think. I mean, I get messages all the time from people that, you know, are not going to be members of Crest for one reason or another, whether they don't live nearby or they can't afford it or they just don't surf that are rooting for me. And, you know, then I have people that are members that are just really stoked for what I'm doing, you know, being a young entrepreneur and you know, trying to bring something to life that they all think is a really cool, neat idea they want to be a part of. So, yeah, I, I think you're, you know, kind of your second layer team too, like your banker, your lawyer, your accountant, like, Hey man, they're rooting for you, right? Like they want to see you be successful and they're telling their friends about this cool project. And there are a lot more people in your corner in business than most people think. Yeah. That's good. I think the other side that you hit on, I think it's really good in sales, right? Man, yes is a great answer. No is a fabulous answer. Maybe is an absolute crappy answer <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah. you know, we spend a lot of time and energy on maybes, right? And let's get to it, you know, kind of in or out. And that's a, it's a real challenging response. And I know folks are probably indecisive, trying to be friendly, trying to be nice, don't want to be disliked because they said no. And there's a lot of reasons for it, but I'll tell any consumer out there ever, like, listen, that was a great answer. Like, I am totally okay with that. We can still be friends. We're going to be fine. Actually, we have a chance of losing our friendship if you string me along for two years right. and decide like, hey, listen, for things that I've already showed you five times while they work, you don't want to do something, right? So oh. that is a bigger challenge for me. What have you found there? Yeah, I know. My, I'm going to steal my cousin's words here. You know, every no gets you closer to a yes and a quick no is just as good as you know, a yes at the end of the day. Just yeah. Kinda, that's 
how you have to approach it. I'm honestly probably not really built for sales because I do get, I think it's just in this project, I'm so invested in it from a passion standpoint. I've done it for 10 years. And I've done every little aspect of it. Like I do get frustrated with people who, you know, the maybes and the no's that have a, a reason that I feel like really is substantial. Like, okay, well, we can get past this if you actually listen to the words coming out of my mouth. So it's a good thing yeah. that he handles all that stuff. But. <laughs> that's good. I mean, listen, let's know your strengths, right? Know yeah. your strength. Know where you're supposed to be. I think that's really good. What's Brett? What's one thing that most people don't know about you? I think there's a lot of things people don't know about me. Yeah, part of you're the you're pretty, pretty, why. pretty quiet guy. Pretty reserved. Yeah, I would say you know, I can be. I'm definitely you know more outgoing than I probably give myself credit for being. But I was never like class clown, you know, like life of the party type of person by any means. Growing up, you know, kind of, I have the attitude of like if you're not helping me, you're in my way, get out of my way type of thing. So like I mm. have definitely kept to myself and like just put my head down and, and worked on things over the years and this being a, a big part of that. But, you know, I think what some, everybody knows I love the surf at this point in time, whether it's a friend or somebody who's interested in this project, like that has been the passion for a long time for me. I think aside from that, you know, I'm really passionate about lacrosse and, and being with my family and just being outside and you know, being with, you know, hanging out with my friends that I don't spend enough time doing. I wouldn't say there's anything that's like really groundbreaking that people don't know about me. I'm not like, okay. a, I'm not like a closeted like musician that you know, should be performing anywhere or anything like that. Like I don't have it. Yeah, I'm, I'm jack of all trades, master of none type of guy, I think, to some extent. But that's good. You know, you let's talk a little bit about we talk about winners when shown data that they are losing, find a way to win. You know, you talked about a permit being pulled, you know, five years ago. You're 28 years old. This is this has been an ongoing dream and project, and the membership's about to all go reality, obviously being half sold and crown broke. So talk us a little bit about, I like to surround myself with people that continue to drive for solutions, which I loved about that. You know, we had good teammates along the way and you know the people who you want to be on the field with and you know the people that you don't think are going to find a way. They're going to show some losing behavior. What's one of those things in your life, post sports, post college, that you've just you know, really had to overcome through. So, I mean, this whole project has kind of been an uphill battle. So like you said, I've been working on it for a better part of probably 10, 15 years since I was a little kid. We talked about doing this and it started out as a conversation around high school and my dad kind of getting thrown in front of some investors that understood kind of what we were doing, but didn't understand surfing necessarily. So that was like the first challenge was like, okay, what does the market look like for this? And our answer was, we don't know. We don't have we didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to spend on a marketing study or anything like that. So it kind of fell onto me to go out and say, okay, how do I prove that there's a market for this? So, you know, building a website, building out social media and like trying to, you know, encourage people to show interest in the project, like something like that, that was like where things started. And then from there, it was kind of convincing a town or, or and a county to work with us because on Long Island, we live in Suffolk County, which is like the eastern half for the most part. There's more undeveloped land and it's cheaper and kind of within our means to buy a piece of property. But you can buy a piece of property and the town doesn't want you to develop it the way that, that you want to develop it. It doesn't matter. They can make your life hell and you know, can kind of you know, force you force your hand not to do what you want to do. So we had to go in and, and basically pitch ourselves and sell ourselves to the town on what we were doing and you know, try to, you know, first time around, didn't go well. We went to three three different townships, four different townships. And you know, they kind of told us sounded okay, kind of get lost and come back. So I think overall, like something that I've struggled with is selling myself and you know, selling the project because like I get why it's exciting. I'm really passionate about it, but then trying to explain that to somebody else and get them just as excited about it to, you know, whether it be, you know, the town to kind of make our lives a little bit easier when it comes to and be more accommodating from a permitting standpoint or sales and the membership side of standpoint, somebody join our team or an investor to write a check. I think that's something that I've definitely struggled with, you know, post-college. So Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, you've, you've overcome that a bit, like, right. You got the deal, you know, you're in build out phase. So fabulous. And tell me a little bit about where this thing's going. Like you got a vision and Long Island's just the start and walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, so we feel that we've carved out a niche in what we're doing here. Our footprint is significantly smaller than pretty much every project out there. You know, we have an exclusive technology partner, and then you know we're looking to build this community of people. So you know we feel like we've developed something that can be replicated. 
our cost of capital is lower. The you know, capex for each project is lower than most projects. So we've started to to look at you know what does this look like after we make our first waves here in New York. You know, can we scale this? Where can we scale it? So with some help, we've identified about a dozen markets in the U.S. that could hold at least one facility. You know, it could range anywhere from being inland and, and landlocked to being on the coast, kind of like New York, East Coast, West Coast. But our thought is that we put these in and around major cities, you know, potentially around the world. So you know, that's our you know, end goal on paper right now, whether or not you know, that's what we're going to do. I'm not entirely sure. Like I said, of 28, I've earned a lot of gray hair over the years and, and trying to build one facility. Who knows what it's going to be like to build you know, two, three, four, five, whatever. But I think end goal would be to build a, a network of Crest Surf Clubs, you know, whether it be around the country or around the world and just kind of grow that community and then leverage that community to to kind of give back and do good with too, which is a really important piece for us. Well, one of the things I will tell you, Brett, is that I've got a number of developer friends and they tell me there's a lot of states that may be easier to develop in than New York, all right? So yeah. I think if you tackle this first hurdle, but you know, a lot of red tape and listen, they're stringent. You have this on the Eastern seaboard of very old states that have been established for a long time. And so there's a lot of rule and regulation and there's typically limited land, right? I mean, it's it's a very dense population. So it, I'm not knocking New York in their in their code. It's just this is the challenge of being on the east. And it's in Massachusetts, it's in Virginia, it's in all along these coasts, right? As the kind of the forefront of our country was all established there. So there's definitely hurdles that you may not find <laughs> in other places. There may be less if that's fair. So it'll be interesting to see as you grow how that may become more efficient, more streamlined, better for you. And I think it'll be uh, fabulous. Love the idea of the global market, man. I mean, obviously this is a sport that's not North American, it's worldwide. So that's pretty exciting. Brett, tell people where they can find you real quick and how they can get in touch with you. Sure. So you can find me on LinkedIn at Brett Portera MBA. And then I can be contacted directly at Brett at Crest Surf Clubs with an S.com. And then all of our Crest stuff can be found at CrestSurfClubs.com or Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, anywhere there. And I have access to all the accounts. So chances are if you even just shoot a DM there, I will see it and be able to get back. Yeah, perfect. All right. For everybody out there, thank you to Brett Portera for joining us. I'm super excited about the Winter Sign Away show every Friday, 12.30 p.m. Nine, uh, that's p.m. Eastern, 12.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 a.m. Pacific. Always look for you on LinkedIn Live, YouTube Live, and Facebook Live every Friday. You can find our podcast on all the major networks. Also, I want to encourage you to check out our site. We have a big event going down in Tulum on growth and investment. If you're looking and you're an owner of a brand and you are looking to grow it fast, please visit us in Tulum. We have a lot of people come down for growth, and it's going to be a very small, unique niche only 12 people coming in on that retreat it's going to be amazing so i hope you can be down there you can find out more that'll also be in the notes below so we'd love to have you join us for that and tulum mexico and their booming growth down there man incredible brett as you've seen down in that area big surfing area and man beautiful weather and now that the tulum airport's open a lot of stuff happening down there in that whole area of mexico that's just continues to develop and grow pretty excited about it Brett, for folks that are out there in a challenge today, facing adversity, facing challenge, you've been there before. What's one of the things you do to stay grounded through the challenge to make sure that you're staying on your path or if you get down, can get you back to that line? Yeah, so I think it's kind of twofold. One is you know, the cheesy saying of eyes on the prize, like no, like focus on where you're going and like where you're trying to get to and know that you know, it's going to be worth it at the end of the day. And then the, the second thing is make sure you have the right people around you that you can you know, fall back on, whether it's actually talking to them about what the problem is or just knowing that there's someone there. I think they both are really important. Yeah, I think those two things intertwine really well too, right? I mean, that's a big thing to have good people to, to remind you of where your focus is supposed to be. Love the Henry Ford quote, you know, the obstacles are those things you see when you take your eyes off your goals. Because as you get focused, as Brett said, like, listen, the other stuff fades away. You don't see the obstacles when you're just driven towards what you got to finish up. And and get done. So super excited about the Crest Surf Club. Brett Portera, thank you so much for being on Winners Find a Way. Super excited for everyone to catch on this show. And we will see you next time on Winners Find a Way. Organizations come to me all the time with challenges of execution and communication with their teams. We help 
build a system through Bloom Growth and software that gives them simplification and prioritization. I teach, facilitate, and coach these organizations to literally double their value. If you're interested in gaining your individual and organizational growth, please email me at trent at leadershipity.com or click the link below and book a 15-minute call on my calendar.